South of South is Australia's most advanced offshore wind project, proposed to be located off the Wellington coast of Gippsland in Victoria. South of the South would inject gigawatts into the grid and the millions into the economy to help meet energy, emissions reduction, and economic goals by supplying secure, reliable, and affordable power for up to 1.0 million homes. The project is in the feasibility study phase with environmental assessment currently underway to inform project planning and approvals. If South of South is approved and proceeds to construction, works could start around the middle of the decade with first power around the end of the decade. South of South is being progressed by a Victorian-based team along with expert offshore wind developers, Copenhagen Infrastructure Partners, and SIBA Super. And today, we are more than honored to speak with Mr. Charles Rotary, CEO of Style of South, as we delve into their offshore wind strategy and the key focuses in Australia. I'm Molly Huang from the Organizing Committee of the Australia Wind Energy 2023. It is my immense pleasure to welcome Mr. Rotary here. Welcome. Thanks, Molly. Great to be here. So, Ms. Rotary, to commence our interview, the first question to you is, how does offshore wind fit into the broader energy mix in Australia? There are two broad themes that uh, drive the need for uh, offshore wind. The first theme is really around commitments being, being made by government and by industry to decarbonise the Australian economy. And that means we need around 15 times the current installed capacity of renewables to be built in the coming decades. In order to deliver that level of scale, we need to use a multitude of tools from our toolkit, which will include onshore technologies, wind, solar, hydro, battery. But in order to hit those types of targets, we need, we need the additional scale that offshore wind can bring. The second thing um, that's happening at the same time is we're seeing uh, the older style of generation starting to exit the market. So in the Australian market, a large part of our generation fleet is from uh, various coals, uh, both black and brown. All of that technology is starting to uh, get quite old. It's in the sort of realms of 40 years old, and it's starting to either become uh, less efficient or need maintenance, or in some cases, it's actually being uh, fully retired. And so the two things that are driving the need for offshore wind, one is the size of the um, net zero target. Uh, and the second thing is the replacement of that generation to make sure we uh, you know, keep the lights on and keep industry running. Thank you so much, Ms. Charles, for your very kind address. And the second question is, why is there a strong investment appetite in Australia? And why specifically for the region of Gippsland? Yeah, so the... The, the, the first question answered part of that, and, and that is the, the need for 15 times the renewables that's already installed in order to meet our net zero targets and, and replace retiring generation. The other things that are um, really important for that are uh, a, a really strong jobs agenda across all levels of government. And offshore uh, technology brings significant jobs both in the uh, construction of the wind farms, but in the, also in the operations, and then a range of adjacent industries that are needed, in, you know, whether that's supplying uh, food and equipment, whether that's supplying the turbines, the, um, the vessels, there's a whole, right, a whole raft of other uh, jobs that are um, really important to all levels of government and to industry. And then the other thing that's happening in the Australian environment is we're seeing a, a rapid change to the legislative environment. The, um, the previous government passed the um, requisite acts through parliament, and we've seen uh, the current federal government get on with uh, declaring zones for offshore wind. They've declared Gippsland. They've run a process to um, apply for a feasibility license for Gippsland. But we're all also seeing them talk about declaring new regions. And so the, um, there's a region in New South Wales that's also um, being considered. Um, and so what you'll see now is Copenhagen Infrastructure Partners have been here for, for a long time. CBUS have made a significant investment into Star of the South. 
you're starting to see a lot of other investors look at Australia due to the uh, fantastic um, macroeconomic uh, side of things in terms of the energy industry, but also the legislative environment that uh, is being created and the willingness of all levels of government to get on with the decisions that they that they need to make to support the industry. Yes. And what are some of the potential benefits of this energy source for the country? Previously, you have briefly touched on the economic benefits and some of the environmental benefits. Maybe you can elaborate more on that part. Yeah, sure. So, so we think we, we've got a sort of four lenses we, we apply uh, when we think about benefits. The, the, the most obvious one and the one that uh, everyone thinks about is the tackling of climate change. It's a very real issue. We need to uh, move towards clean energy and the investment for Australia, but also globally is uh, significant in terms of megawatts, but also significant in terms of you know, billions and perhaps trillions of, of dollars to, de to deliver on those targets. And um, the, the second thing, and I've touched very briefly on this, but uh, is the, the number of jobs that offshore wind creates. In the case of Star of the South, we're talking about over 2000 jobs a large number of those jobs will be in regional uh, communities. And one of the things we've seen in the Australian context is um, industries such as agriculture and whatnot, as they um, have become more industrialised, we've seen some of our regional communities have less investment by bringing projects such as Star of the South to life in, in Gippsland, in a regional part of Australia, we can make billions of dollars of investment into those uh, communities. Uh, and in the case of Star of the South, we have uh, our Melbourne office that you you referenced in the introduction, but we also have uh, two offices um, in in regional uh, parts of Australia where we we employ local um, local people. Another really important part, and I think this is not unique to Australia, uh, but the Australian experience is um, uh, is quite is quite quite unique in the sense that it, it's. Um, uh, a very Australian experience, but we're seeing it in a lot of other markets as well. And that is uh, the traditional custodians of the land that we are, we are trying to develop these projects on because there's a large onshore component and there's a connection with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people for the, between them and, and the land for um, tens of thousands of years. And we uh, are on a journey of exploration and understanding with, the, the, in our case, the Gunna Kunai people to make sure that our project is respectful in the way that we develop it and, and we can form a, a true partnership with, with the, the Gunna Kunai uh, people in the case of Gippsland. Um, and then I think the, the, the last thing that's really important in terms of a, a community benefit, whether that's onshore or offshore, is just making sure we really sensitively uh, design and deliver this project. So in the case of onshore, that's making sure we think very deeply about any um, vegetation that we might need to um, remove and then replace. But in the offshore environment, that's thinking about um, you know, commercial fishes, that's thinking about um, sea, uh, you know, shipping lanes, that's thinking about all sorts of uh, sea mammals and birds and making sure that our project is delivered in the, with the lowest possible impact on uh, those various environments. Thank you so much, Mr. Charles. Um, all, offshore wind in Australia is generally a niche sector. What has led to Style of South being the most advanced offshore wind project in Australia? Maybe you can share with us some of your secret recipe. Yep. So, so I think there's I think there's three three things. The first is the vision, and the the founders of the project, uh, the three individual um, people, but then CIP uh, who also saw that vision and saw the need for offshore wind in the the context of Victoria, and really having the uh, willingness to back what at the time was seen as, as something that perhaps wasn't needed in the Australian context. And it's only in recent times that uh, it's become something that is more, more prominently spoken about. And so that vision piece was really, really important. The second thing that's really important is a social license. And Star of the South has invested incredibly heavily in uh, taking the community for the journey 
uh, whether that's the traditional custodians of uh, the land on which our transmission uh, assets will be, uh, whether that's farming communities, whether that's local towns, uh, we've invested very heavily. And at the same time, we've seen a community that has invested very heavily in our projects. We've had a lot of people volunteer hours of their time to help us shape the project and help us really think deeply about the impact that we are going to have on um, on Gippsland, both from a um, perceived uh, negative perspective where people are concerned about things like visual amenity, and then the very positive things such as significant investment in, in local jobs. And then I think the final thing uh, that's really important is, is having the capital, the patient capital, willing to support uh, that type of vision. And the, you, you mentioned uh, Copenhagen Infrastructure Partners and they're very experienced globally in these types of projects, in particular opening new markets. At the same time, we've also had uh, CBUS uh, invest in the project a little over a year ago. And it, you know, it's been fantastic to get their expertise in terms of uh, bringing uh, infrastructure to life in the Australian context. Thank you, Ms. Rotary. But remember, Australia offshore wind is quite new and we have to build everything from scratch. So how has South of South contributed to the offshore wind industry development in Australia? And what are the specific challenges to creating this new industry? Yeah. Uh, so the previous question, I, I I really dealt with the first part of this answer, which was this kind of pioneering spirit that um, the team has has been able to show. And it's having that very clear vision and an understanding of the need for offshore wind, and then being able to really back that with capability and, and, and capital uh, and get a community on board with what you're, what you're trying to do. So that's, that's one really big part of it. I think there are other there are two other really um, big parts where uh, Star of the South, um, CIP, and CBUS have invested heavily. One is around workers. These projects, as I said, will need thousands of uh, uh, construction workers. They'll need um, operations uh, in, uh, team members, and we have in Australia uh, a, a skilled workforce. And a lot of their skills are transferable from where they're currently working uh, into our renewable energy. And so we've spent a lot of time working with uh, current employers of those uh, individuals, with training institutions and with the uh, potential employees themselves on what's needed uh, locally to deliver a project such as Star of the South, but also to support an industry as it grows to be much larger than, than, a, than just one project. And then the, the last part where we've spent a lot of time is really understanding the local supply chain. Uh, you know, there's billions of dollars worth of uh, capital equipment in each of these projects. And what we really wanted to understand through that work is where can Australian uh, manufacturers play a role? What are the types of components and um, pieces of capital equipment they can contribute and uh, skill up to manufacture? And so we work very closely with the supply chain to see how much of that we can we can onshore. And we've worked whether that's with suppliers, local communities, but also all levels of government, whether that's um, you know, local councils, state government or federal government. We've had fantastic engagement on the types of supply chain opportunities that there are. Yes. Speaking of the second part of the question, what are the specific challenges to creating this new industry? Maybe there are some challenges that keep you awake all night. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, I sleep very soundly. We have a, a fantastic team, Molly. Um, I, I think there's a there's a few things that I've just called out. You know, one is this kind of supply um, supply chain point, and, and 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 really we're seeing significant demand globally for offshore wind components. Uh, offshore wind, the, the appropriate vessels for the delivery of these, these projects. We're seeing global demand uh, really skyrocket. And so being able to convince investors, convince suppliers that Australia is a great place to um, to invest, a great place to, to bring business and, and where you're going to have a certainty in terms of pipeline, you know, that, that that's a big part of what we uh, think about. But in terms of what 
really would keep me awake at night. Like what, what I really am focused on is maintaining that social license. And that social license uh, is takes years to build up, but can very quickly evaporate. And our relationship with uh, kind of Kunai people and alignment of an attempt by us at least to align our values with what their stated values are and really listening to what is important to Gunnar Kurnai uh, people, um, you know, both collectively and then on in, within smaller um, voices within that, uh, that those, these people is uh, really, really important to what we're, we're doing. And at the same time, social licence with farmers, with uh, small towns, with larger regional centres, and making sure that uh, we take the community on that journey and we listen and, and hear the challenges that they're, they're seeing. And, um, you know, if I was to identify one thing that would keep me awake at night, it's really making sure we get that part right because we're going to invest in this in this community for 20, 30 years. Uh, these, in the case of Gunnar Kurnai, they've been there for tens of thousands of years. In the, in the case of... Um, farmers and whatnot, there's, there's a couple of hundred years of, of history. Um, they're going to be there long after we've left. So we want to make sure we we really um, work with communities to get those projects delivered. Yeah, that requires extensive communication, extensive collaboration, extensive investment. Um, so looking ahead, what are the key milestones for South of South and for the offshore wind industry in Australia, in your words? Yeah, so we've had a couple of great milestones recently. Um, in particular, we recently completed uh, our offshore geotech. So that's the first time uh, any any wind farm in Australia has gone offshore and uh, actually looked into the seabed in some degree of detail. So that's a fantastic milestone. From an industry uh, standpoint, uh, there are a couple of really big things uh, coming up. Uh, in terms of Gippsland for Start of South and uh, other uh, projects, we recently submitted our feasibility licence application. And so we'll be looking to work with uh, the federal government and um, you know, state government to the extent that, the, that they'll be involved around the um, awarding of those feasibility licences. And the feasibility licences, if, if Start of the South is successful in uh, obtaining one of those, there'll be further feasibility activities that we would look to undertake. The, the other major uh, sort of thing that's occurring in uh, our market is where we're working very closely with all levels of government, but also with the energy retailers and um, large corporates ar around the potential for, for offtake. The Victorian government has released its um, various implementation statements and are looking um, you know, at what timing they'll have for a for an auction, and that will be the the next big uh, milestone. And we we look forward to hearing you know further from the Victorian government, who's been really proactive uh, in terms of Victorian activities. Uh, what we're also the other big milestone uh, in terms of the Australian context will be the declaration of uh, a region in New South Wales. We're expecting that uh, to be uh, you know sometime uh, relatively soon. And so when that happens, it'll be open to proponents to apply for a feasibility licence in the uh, newly declared zone. We just look forward to, to hearing from the federal government on with respect to that. The future sounds bright. Thank you, Mr. Rutgers, really for your very kind address. Undoubted, South of South has a great role to play and will continue to lead Australia's offshore wind market growth. Thank you once again for your generosity in sharing your knowledge and expertise with us. We are genuinely honored to have you join us today and we eagerly anticipate your presence at the Australia Wind Energy 2023. Thanks, Molly. Thank you so much.